Alright guys, welcome back to another set of videos. <laughs> so in this one we'll be looking to complete questions 15 all the way to 19 and then hopefully get everything done in a very easy and simple way. So yeah guys, as always, let me know if you've got any questions, but otherwise, let's jump straight in. <clears throat> okay, so number 15, A. Simplify 3x squared y to the power 5, all of it powered by 4. When you have something like this, it's so easy. All you literally do is distribute the power 4 to everything. So we're going to have 3 to the power of 4. x squared already has a power, so it'll be 2 times 4. y has a power, so it'll be 5 times 4. And then you just simplify this fully. So 3 to the power of 4, and you put it on your calculator, which will give us 81. x to the power of 2 times 4, which is 8. So x to the power of 8. And as for y, it's just 5 times 4, which is 20. And that's it. That's this one done. Now for B, expand and simplify 4n times n minus 3 times n plus 5. Right, so to start with these kind of questions, every time you've got brackets involved, you work with the brackets, yeah, and leave everything else. So right now, let's just ignore the 4n, yeah? Now to expand the double bracket, it's the same as always. So do n times n, n times 5, and then minus 3 times n, and minus 3 times 5. So let's just keep 4n outside for a second, yeah? So now we've got n times n, which is n squared, n times 5n, which is plus 5n, and then you've got minus 3 times n, which is minus 3n, so you've got plus 5n, minus 3n, and lastly, minus 3 times 5 is minus 15. Okay, now all you want to do is firstly collect like terms before you, you deal with the 4n, so it'd be 4n times, and then you've got n squared. Now these two here combine to make a positive 2n, because 5 take away 3 is 2, minus 15 and now you just multiply everything by 4n so it'll be 4n times n squared which is 4n cubed 4n times 2n which is 8n squared and lastly 4n times 15 is minus 60n and that's it that's this one done too for c factorize 4c squared minus 9d squared now, you have to literally spot this because you probably realize that, firstly, there is nothing in common between C and D or 4 and 9. But, when you, but you have two things in common. You have, firstly, they're both square terms. You've got 4, which is a square number, C is squared, 9 is a square number, D is squared. So, in this case, we need to use a method known as dots, which is the difference of two squares. And difference of two squares means you can factorize them into double brackets. Now, to get the answer, easy. 4c squared, you just have to square root each term. So square rooting 4c squared will give us a 2c. And then square rooting 9 and d squared will give us a 3d. And then you just put plus and minus. Okay. As for d, simplify fully x squared minus 7x plus 12 all over 4x minus x squared. Okay, so in this case, you would have to factorize the top half separately and then the bottom half separately. So let's look at the top half first, yeah? So the top half is actually a quadratic equation. And the way that works is that you can factorize into double brackets. And because you work with x squared, it's going to be x on both of them. Okay? Now, to figure out where the, what the rest of the terms are, we just need to ask ourselves, what two numbers multiply to make a 12? Okay? So let's go ahead and write a list. So you can have 1 times 12, uh, 2 times 6, or 3 times 4. Now, one of these pairs will also give us a sum or difference of a 7. Now, looking at numbers, only 3 and 4 can make a 7. And how to get minus 7? Well, you need to do minus 3, minus 4. And that gives us a minus 7. And yeah, that's the top half done. Now, as for the bottom half, to factorize 4x minus x squared, you look at both of them and they both have an x. So, we can take our x from both of them, so divided by x, and you're left with a 4 minus x. And yeah... Looks like we're actually almost done, but the only weird thing now is that we got x minus 4 and 4 minus x. Now the cool thing is, on the bottom half, what you could actually do, you could literally, um, like there's a little trick here. If you factorize a negative sign, then this becomes negative and this becomes plus. It's a little math trick, and what you can really say is that this is basically x minus 4 now. And now it's x minus 4, you can actually cancel down. So these two can go. And when you do this, you're going to get something like x minus 3 over minus x. Okay, number 16. So there are 12 b's in a bag. Now, 7 out of the 12 are red, 
three of the 12 are green and finally two of the 12 are yellow so when you do probability questions always make sure you note down the probabilities of every single possible uh, possible scenario like i did over here this will literally help you guys for the later questions now next bit lucy takes at random a bead from the bag and then keeps it so that means the 12 will drop to 11 then julian takes at random a bead from the bag as well now work out the probability that they each take a yellow bead all right so this is easy so this is the probability taking of lucy taking yellow first and then julian taking yellow second now the probability of taking yellow first is of course you got two beads so two out of twelve now since lucy keeps the bead there's only one left and you now got a total of 11 beads in the bag and this is simple probability you literally just put this in the calculator and you're going to get a simplified answer of one out of 66 okay done b work out the probability that the bees that they take are not the same color okay so this is literally one of those combination questions yeah so we have to think about all the different combinations you can get so for instance you could firstly take um, what colors we have again so we've got red green yellow so you could take a red bead first and then take a green second or you could take a red bead and then take yellow and this can extend to other ones yeah you can take um, a green bead and then a red or a green bead and then a yellow and of course you can also take a yellow first then a red and then a yellow first or a green so you actually have six different probabilities now thankfully a lot of these you can see are repeated like red and green or green and red red and yellow yellow and red or yellow and green green yellow so naturally you can just work out three of them and then double your answer because to get the same amount now to get red and green so we'll do some of these in steps so red we've got seven out of twelve so you've got seven bees which are red to get green we got three of them and there's eleven bees left altogether to get red and yellow again red is seven out of twelve and to get yellow there's two yellows and you've got eleven left so two out of 11 so what i'm going to do guys i'll just do three of these and then we're going to sum the total them up and then double it now we did red and green red and yellow let's do which one is, yeah green and yellow that's the only one left so to do green yellow for the greens we got three out of 12 in the bag and yellow we got two out of 11 left and that's it so now in your calculator put this inside plus this result plus this result so and once you do that you must you must then double your answer by two to account for like the other ways of doing it and when you do that you'll get a final probability result of 41 out of 66. okay number 17. so here we're given a solid sphere and a solid cylinder now the radius of the sphere and the cylinder are both r centimeters but the height of the cylinder is two r centimeters so twice the radius now the total surface area of the cylinder is given as k pi now a quick recap the uh, surface area is literally the the area around the entire shape now if we look at the cylinder for instance we have three different segments we got the we got the base and the and the top bit which are both circles by the way and then we got the curved surface area which frankly they give us in the they give us a form in the front of the book now just labeling each bit so this bit is the area of a circle which is pi r squared this bit is the area of a circle again which is pi r squared now the curved surface area is actually um, 2 times pi r times the height. So in a way it's literally the circumference times the height. That's how they calculate it. Now we're given everything. Because everything's because the radius is r, we don't actually have to change these formulas. But because we know the height which is 2r, we can update this one here. So it would be 2 pi r times 2r. Now you can just collect the numbers, so 2 times 2 is, is uh, 4, and then you've got pi, and then you've got r times r, which is r squared. So this is going to be literally the curved surface area bit. Now, they, t they tell us that the total surface... So, <clears throat> so now they tell us that the total surface area is k pi. So in other words, if we add up all these surface areas, so we're going to add up pi r squared, another pi r squared, and now 4 pi r squareds, we're going to get 6 pi r squareds. And this is going to equal to k pi. Now looking at both sides, well, you got they both got pi, and we can just knock them off right now, divide by pi, and it tells us that k equals 6r squared. And that's it, that's literally k found. Show that the ratio, which is the total surface area of the cylinder to the total surface area of the sphere, is the same ratio as the volumes of both shapes. 
all right so we've already found total surface area of the cylinder which was um, 6 pi r squared so that's quite quite easy now as for the total surface area of a sphere they actually give you this in the front of the book which is um, 4 pi r squared okay so that's fine so we put that here as well now just simplifying this ratio for a second you can literally just cancel pi r squared on both and you've got now 6 to 4 and then dividing that again you're going to get 3 to 2 so that's literally the the ratios fully simplified between both now we're trying to do the same for the volume so let's do it so the volume of the cylinder is um is actually given as well which is supposed to be pi r squared times the height and the volume of the sphere is also given to be four thirds pi r squared cubed or pi r cubed now height again we know what it is height was do, 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 it was 2r so let's put that in here yeah? so we're going to now have pi r squared times 2r proportional to 4 thirds uh, pi r cubed now just simplifying this bit again you just stick 2 in front times the r so you get pi, 2 pi r cubed proportional to 4 thirds pi r cubed and now cancelling all the, the, the like terms like pi r cubed on both sides you now got 2 to 4 thirds. This is actually not such a difficult question. And now, oops, fraction. Now all you want to do is times 3 across to clear the fraction. So you got 6 to 4. And then simplifying this by halving it, you're going to get 3 and 2. Done. And then you got the same ratio. Show that this third fraction can be written in the form like this, where n is an integer. In other words, a whole number. Show you working clearly. Now, the cool thing about these questions is that you can actually right now throw this in your calculator. If you put all of this at once, you're going to get a result of exactly 2 plus root 2n, uh, 2 plus root 2. Now, this is what they want you to have. But to get to this step, you need to show enough evidence that you got it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pretty much show enough tricks to get you the marks every time. Now, for third problems, the common idea is that you, all, you would always need to rationalize. This is literally the common idea. When you have a fraction and, and, and they give you a solution which is a non-fraction, you would have to somehow clear the thirds in the bottom. Now to do that, it's super easy. Just copy the whole fraction and then always multiply by something known as this conjugate, which is the opposite of the denominator. So if you've got root 8 minus 2, we want root 8 plus 2. Same, same goes if it was a plus here. If it was root 8 plus 2, then you're going to times up and down by root 8 minus 2. So let's copy the same thing here, yeah? Now all you want to do is literally multiply this head on with the, the left side of the fraction. So you're going to have root 8 times root 8, which is a whole 8 by the way. Two thirds make a whole. And then root 8 times 2 is just 2 root 8. When, this is, when you times a third of a whole number, you just stick them together. Now for the denominator, you got to do you got to treat this as if it was a double bracket quadratic problem, yeah? So it'd be root 8 times root 8, which is a whole 8. And then root 8 times 2, which is plus 2 root 8. And then minus 2 times root 8, which is minus 2 root 8. And lastly, minus 2 times plus 2 is minus 4. Now, just to simplify your life, you can literally just um, put, the, put everything in the bottom in the calculator. And if you did that, you'd be left with exactly 4. On the top half, however, you've got to be a bit strategic. So for the 2 root 8, you can actually simplify root 8. But we're going to go ahead and put all of this part in the calculator, 2 root 8. And if you did that, you're going to get exactly 4 root 2. And we just copied 8 here. Now, thankfully, this is enough evidence, yeah? At this point, you can literally put this in the calculator. And you'll get your result of 2 plus root 2. And you're done. Okay, number 19. So B, C, D, and E are points in the circle. So here we go. B, C, D, and E. A, B, this line of the arrow, is parallel to E, D, this other line of the arrow. So they're both moving in the same direction. Angle ABE, which is over here, is 73 degrees. Work at the size of angle DCE, so DCE. In other words, this angle between them. Now, there's a super easy method to do this. Now, my tip is that you've got sort of like an incomplete shape. And what I would personally recommend is that this, this point C stops and then connects to E. You might as well go ahead and connect it all the way to B for a second, yeah? I'll explain why. Now, one, one useful tip is that every time you've got a tangent that hits the circle, we can use a method known as the alternate segment theorem. Now, what this method tells us is that we know that at, at the angle, at the other side of the chord, 
is equal to the angle at the tangent. So in other words, this angle at tangent, which is 73, divided by chord, on the other side of the chord, i.e. the arrow coming off it, so this angle here, would also be the same of 73. Now this is going to be useful in a second, yeah, because you're going to pair this up with another theorem. So let's just keep a note of that, yeah? So angle on the other side of chords are equal at the tangent. Now, one thing to note is that looking at the shape, we have now a four-sided shape, yeah? We have something called a cyclic or cyclic quadrilateral. What this tells us is that when you've got four points that touches at the ends of within a circle, like four points within a circle, you can form a quadrilateral. And at the opposite end of each point, like point C to point E, we can sum up these two angles to make 180. Likewise, you can say between D and B, we have another two pairs that add up to 180. Now, one thing to note here, let's look at point E for a second. And let's just fill this up before we use the method. We can say that because we've got um, parallel lengths as well over here, we can say that this angle is equal to this angle too, using because they're both alternate or corresponding, one of those two. We can now say that angle C, which is X plus 73, plus 73 must add up to make 180. That is the cyclic quadrilateral rule. So these two pairs add up to make 180. That's it. Now we just solve for x and we got it. So you can have 180 equals x plus, and then 73 plus 73 is 146. Subtract 146 across, and you're going to get x value of 34 degrees. And that's it. That's literally um, angle DCE found.